Cue and Review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the National Podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Cune Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. From the National... Tuesday the 2nd of April, from the news section, London to Glasgow trains disrupted with passengers stuck for hours. Article written by Lucy Garcia. Train passengers travelling on the West Coast mainline are suffering severe disruption because of a signalling fault at London's Euston station, with some stuck on stationary trains for at least two hours. Network Rail apologised for the incident and said its engineers are working to fix the problem as soon as possible. The West Coast Main Line runs between Euston and Glasgow with branches to major cities such as Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester and Edinburgh. Avanti West Coast issued an alert to passengers which stated Trains to and from London Euston may be cancelled or delayed due to a fault with the signalling system affecting multiple platforms at the station. Services operated by London Overground and London North Western Railway are also affected. A Network Rail spokesperson said, We're so sorry for the disruption at Euston and we're doing everything we can to fix it. Our signal cleaning system is designed to put signals to red if it detects a problem, a kind of safety failsafe, and has done so on some of the tracks approaching the station this afternoon. We're working with operators to run trains on the lines and platforms that are working as normal, but there are delays and cancellations as a result. We advise passengers to check with their operator before they travel to or from Euston this afternoon while we work to find and fix the problem. One affected passenger, Paul Carroll, posted on X, formerly known as Twitter, that he had been stuck in a train for two hours not moving. Another passenger reported being stuck in a train at Stockport for two hours. The disruption comes after Euston was closed for long distance services between Good Friday and Easter Monday for engineering work, which included renewing the track between the station and Milton Keynes. That article was written by Lucy Garcia and read by me, Ian McKenna. From the National, Tuesday the 2nd of April, from the news section, exclusive, Michael Gove accused of vilifying Muslims in Sickening Lurch to Write Article written by Steph Braun Michael Gove has been accused of whipping up Islamophobic hysteria following the UK government's treatment of Muslims in recent weeks. SNP MP Owen Thompson, the party's chief whip, met last week with Zara Mohammed, Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, MCB, who told him of a hostile and scaremongering attitude towards her and the organisation whipped up by the UK government's lurch to the right and Gove's sickening dog whistle poli- politics. Gove is facing threats of legal action after naming Muslim organisations earlier this month that could fall foul of a new definition of extremism and that Whitehall should avoid engaging with. The MCB has consulted lawyers in anticipation of seeking a judicial review if banned from Whitehall and Westminster. Thompson said after meeting with Mohammed, he was horrified by her concerns about the rising tide of Islamophobia. He told The National, Gove and the UK government are fanning the flames of hate. They are looking everywhere for scapegoats and Muslim people are now the easiest targets. There is a frightening mainstreaming of the kind of politics that would not have looked out of place in a National Front pamphlet in the 1970s. It was a real privilege and an honour to meet with Zara but I was horrified to learn of her worries about a rising tide in Islamophobia whipped up by the UK government's lurch to the right. There is a sickening demonisation of Islam going on 
which damages community relations and creates alarm among, among Muslims across Scotland and Britain. Sarah is a great role model and works hard to represent and support honest, hard-working Scottish Muslims. It is chilling to see Islamophobic hysteria and a hostile and scaremongering attitude being targeted against her and her organisation. Earlier this year, Mohammed learned that the Ministry of Defence was ending its 12-year relationship with the MCB. The organisation, the UK's largest Muslim umbrella group with more than 500 affiliated members including mosques, schools and charitable associations, had been acting as a referee for potential MLM chaplains in the armed forces. Previously, Mohammed said, It is barking. There is no replacement. They left a gap because we are the leading Muslim representative body that is trusted, so there is no one. A preliminary ministerial statement indicates Gove was considering mentioning the Muslim Association of Britain, Cage International, Muslim Engagement and Development, Five Pillars, and the Friends of Al-Aqsa alongside far-right groups such as Britain First, British National Socialist Movement and Patriotic, Patriotic Alternative, as falling foul of the new extremism definition, according to reports. Thompson said Mohammed had been constantly asked to prove she is not an extremist since the Hamas attacks of October the 7th on Israel. He added, There seems to be an ongoing trend of vilifying Muslims. It's a systemic issue where they are often made the easy target in cultural conflicts. Engaging with the MCB should be encouraged since they represent numerous Muslim communities. By isolating and marginalising Muslims, the UK government are hiding, hindering their potential contribution. Since the atrocious 7th of October attacks by Hamas in Israel, Zara Mohammed says she has been constantly asked to prove she is not an extremist. She does not represent Hamas, neither does her organisation. In Islam, the killing of innocent civilians is utterly condemned. We all need to work together to build a better Scotland, not allow ourselves to be divided by the sickening dog whistle politics of Gove and his ilk. The UK government has been approached for comment, and that article was an exclusive by Steph Braun. From the National, Tuesday the 2nd of April, from the comment section, Homelessness plan leaves Rishi Sunak stuck between rock and hard place. Piece by Shona Craven, columnist and community editor. Finally, an issue that is uniting Tories on the left and the right, a divided party coming together with a common aim. How unfortunate for Rishi Sunak that the aim is to block his government's own legislation. The Times did not mince its words with its online headline. Sunak faces Tory revolt over a plan to criminalise homelessness. The right-leaning newspaper is not just reporting the opinions of those MPs who plan to rebel over the criminal justice bill, it's accepting them as fact on the grounds that the new powers it contains are so broad that anyone sleeping rough in England or Wales could be declared a nuisance and face the threat of prison simply for having nowhere else to go. Sunak will surely now be regretting some of the bargains he made with his former Home Secretary Suala Breverman, who, let's not forget, he reappointed to that role when he became Prime Minister in October 2022, just six days after she had resigned from it for breaching the ministerial code. It took him until last November to finally sack her, following the publication of an inflammatory Times column in which she referred to a perception that senior police officers play favourites when it comes to protesters. Many were appalled that she was still in post by then, as in the month before she had pushed for draconian action against homeless people. We cannot allow our streets to be taken over by rows of tents occupied by people, many of them from abroad, living on the streets as a lifestyle choice, she tweeted before announcing plans to stop, to stop rough sleepers getting hold of tents from charities. This particular idea provoked outrage and was quickly dropped, but a raft of other measures relating to nuisance rough sleeping remain in the Criminal Justice Bill, which is designed to replace the 200-year-old Vacancy Act. Nobody should be criminalised for simply having nowhere to live, the UK government declared in a policy paper that promised a suite of modern replacement powers to tackle the begging and rough sleeping that causes a nuisance to the public. Was that phrasing deliberately provocative? 
A sweep being one thing, among many, that those sleeping in the streets are lacking, and the supposedly modern new approach not seeming vastly different to the laws passed in 1824. It was expected that the chunky criminal justice bill would be debated last month, opening up, among many other issues, the debates around abortion law that I wrote about in these pages in anticipation, but it was paused to allow ministers to negotiate with a group of more than 40 Conservative MPs who have said they will vote against it unless the measures relating to rough sleeping are significantly amended. At the forefront of these efforts is Bob Blackman, chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for ending homelessness and the MP behind the 2017 Homelessness Reduction Act, which began as his private member's bill. He has declared the new bill completely unacceptable and tabled amendments designed to steer the focus back towards helping homeless people rather than criminalising them. Blackman wants guidance issued to councils and police forces to state that begging or sleeping rough does not in itself amount to action causing harassment, alarm or distress in the absence of other factors, does not in itself amount to unreasonable conduct in the absence of other factors, and that the new powers relating to antisocial behaviour should not in general be used in relation to people sleeping rough and should be in re- used in relation to people begging only where no other approach is reasonably available. He has support from One Nation toys including Damien Green and Caroline Knox, as well as more right-wing colleagues such as Ian Duncan-Smith. This leaves Sunak stuck between a rock and a hard place. When trying to pass a tough on crime bill, it looks weak to be forced to walk out water down your proposals. But opponents of Blackman's amendments expose themselves to the accusation that the bill is indeed designed to criminalise rough sleeping itself, in contrast to the UK government's stated aim. It's difficult to imagine who, other than Braverman and her extremist acolytes, would consider the fining or imprisoning of homeless people the solution to anything. What is clearly needed is action from the government to reduce homelessness by tackling its causes, which unavoidably means building a lot more homes, but also providing support, rather than penalty notices, to those in the streets who are at risk of being deemed a nuisance. Keir Starmer will doubtless be delighting in headlines about revolting Conservatives, but it won't be enough for him to sit back and chuckle at them falling out over this. Will he have the guts to put forward credible plans to tackle the causes of rough sleeping? Or will he shrug and claim, as he has with almost every other policy area, that his Labour government won't be able to afford to do anything about it? And that comment piece was by Shona Craven. The National, recorded on Wednesday, 3rd of April 2024. The Culture Section. Back in the day, Life of the Original Crooked Man, General Sir Alexander Leslie, by Hamish McPherson, journalist. It was this week, 363 years ago, that General Sir Alexander Leslie, the first Earl of Leven, died after a long and adventurous life. He was also Lord Balgoni, and it was at Balgoni Castle in Fife that he died in his bed on April 4, 1661, at the age of 80 or 81. We do not know his exact age because, as is so often the case of people in that era, there is no record of his birth date, but it is believed to have happened in the year 1580. There is another reason that his birth was not recorded. He was born illegitimate in an age where that was still very much a mark of shame. He may have been born out of wedlock, but that did not stop Leslie from gaining the highest military honours and becoming involved at the top level in the battles, intrigues and politicking that engulfed Scotland, England and Ireland in the mid-17th century. At birth he was acknowledged as the son of George Leslie of Balgoni, who was then the captain of Blair Castle. His mother was said to be a wench in Rannoch, but there's no definite recording of her or her name. Leslie was fostered by the Campbells of Glenorchy, which gave him close family connections that he maintained all his life. As was often the case with children who had no chance of an inheritance, and because his illegitimacy barred him from entering the church, as soon as he finished his education, Leslie became a professional soldier. He was first signed up for duty in the Netherlands, and probably served under the English commander Sir Horace Vere in the Dutch state's army, but he definitely was in the Swedish army by 1608 in the service of King Charles IX, who was constantly at war with Poland and occasionally with Denmark and Russia. 
Leslie distinguished himself in various battles, and when Charles died and his teenage son Gustavus Adolphus came to the throne, Leslie was already a leading figure in the Swedish army. The great Gustavus Adolphus is often recognised as one of the finest and most innovative military commanders of all time, and he seems to have had a special regard for Leslie, making him a general in knighting the Scot. It was a time of religious upheaval, and the king's espousal of the Protestant cause suited Leslie. Later, he would recruit many Presbyterian Scottish officers and men to the Swedish military in the Thirty Years' War. They included David Leslie, no relation, who would become his second in command. Alexander Leslie was wounded at the Battle of Lutzen in 1632, the same battle in which Gustavus Adolphus was killed. The king was succeeded by his seven-year-old daughter Christina, and Sweden entered a period of regency. Leslie's return to duty saw him take effective control of the Swedish army of the Vesa, and in 1636 he was appointed a field marshal. Later that year he was in joint command of the Swedish army as they won the Battle of Wittstock against the Allied forces of the Holy Roman Empire. One of his officers in this engagement was General John Ruthven, who was married to Leslie's daughter Barbara. Both Leslie and Ruthven had returned to Scotland by 1638, Leslie having been invited to command the army raised by the Scottish Covenanters as they took control of the reins of government in Scotland. King Charles I's repeated attempts at imposing Anglican worship and bishops in Presbyterian Scotland saw Leslie command the Covenanters' forces in the Bishops' Wars, where again he was successful, capturing Edinburgh Castle and winning the Battle of Newburn, before occupying Newcastle and forcing the King to negotiate a peace treaty. A curious development in 1641 saw Charles I create Leslie as Earl of Leven and Lord Balgoni in an attempt to get the country's most famous soldier on his side. Leslie accepted the titles, and as part of his duty to Charles, he led a Scottish army against Catholic rebels in Ireland. By 1644, however, he had switched allegiance to the Covenanters again and led their army into England to fight alongside the Parliament's forces against the Royalists. Now well into his 60s, Leslie was in command of the successful parliamentary forces at the Battle of Marston Moor in 1644. He later accepted the surrender of Charles I, who he imprisoned in Newcastle. Oliver Cromwell's new model army was now almost in control of England, and the action which besmirched Leslie's name in the eyes of many then took place in January 1647. He handed Charles I to the Parliament forces in return for payments to compensate the Scots. Had Charles accepted the covenant, Leslie made it clear the king would not have been handed over. Leslie had amassed considerable wealth in his career, and now wished to retire to Balgoni Castle, which he had acquired and refurbished, but the execution of Charles I sparked another conflict between Scotland and England, and Cromwell's troops marched north to rout the Scots at the Battle of Dunbar in 1650. David Leslie, and not Alexander, commanded the Scots. The following year, Leslie was captured and imprisoned in the Tower of London, Queen Christina intervened to seek the release of a man who was revered as a national hero in Sweden, and Leslie was able to spend the rest of his life at Balgoni. There's a curious postscript to Leslie's life. Because of his cunning and his switching of sides, he's said to be the inspiration for this traditional nursery rhyme. There was a crooked man and he went a crooked mile. He found a crooked sixpence against a crooked stile. He bought a crooked cat which caught a crooked mouse. And they all lived together in a little crooked house. Supposedly, the crooked style is the border between England and Scotland, and the crooked house is the agreement between Leslie and the English Parliament. One wonders if the creators of the many plays, television programmes and films that feature the crooked mile in their title know they're referring back to Alexander Leslie. By Hamish McPherson The National, recorded on Tuesday 2nd of April 2024 The Culture Section Back in the day Rutherglen, the ancient town so interesting that I'm writing about it twice. By Hamish McPherson, journalist. Today, for the first time in this series, I'm having to write a second column about an ancient town, Rutherglen, because as I researched the history of this royal borough that is now in South Lanarkshire, I discovered that it is such an interesting story to tell. Well, I consider my general knowledge of Scotland to be adequate. I research and write my back-in-the-day columns each week from scratch. I'm very much learning as I go along, and I like to think that keeps my product fresh, while I find this approach stimulating for me. Deadlines always did get my adrenaline going, so has it been with Rutherglen. Many people still think it is part of Glasgow, and with the northernmost part of the town less than three miles from Glasgow city centre and its western boundary less than a mile from Hampden Park, 
you could be forgiven for thinking Rogonians are actually Glaswegians. But as I shall show today, Rutherglen fought for the right to remain an independent royal borough in the face of a determined attempt by Glasgow to swallow it up. As I always write, we need to know our history before we can move into our future as a Scotland which has regained its independence, and I am glad to say this series in our ancient towns has had a positive response and people are appreciating what I am trying to do, to encourage people to learn local history, and I appear not to have made too many mistakes so far. To be included in the list of ancient towns, they all have to have played a part in the history of Scotland and have been established as a town, usually a borough, before the Reformation in 1560. I also suggested that anyone who wanted to promote their town for a column should email me at nationalhamish at gmail.com. As I revealed last week, I received several impassioned pleas for Rutherglen, or Ruglin in Scots, to be included, and I have found its story quite fascinating. As a result of other emails, I'm going to add two further towns in East Lothian, North Berwick and Dunbar, as well as Dunkeld in the ancient county of Perthshire, in my growing list of future subjects. Back to Rutherglen, and again I acknowledge my main source is Rutherglen Lore, story of an 800-year-old royal borough by William Ross Shearer, 1922, and the Reverend David Ewer's 1793 work, History of Rutherglen and East Colbride. The work of the Rutherglen Heritage Society has also proved invaluable. Last week I told how Rutherglen's name was most likely derived from the Gaelic for Red Glen, and that the Romans had occupied the area in the second century, leaving behind the Gallo Flat Tumulus, a Roman burial site. I also described how Rutherglen had a strategic importance as the place where the tidal reach of the River Clyde reached its highest point, vital for Rutherglen's industrial development as we shall see. I related how King David I made Rutherglen a royal borough in 1126 and how subsequent monarchs confirmed that status while the rivalry with Glasgow grew down the centuries. Rutherglen Castle played a role in the Wars of Independence before Regent Moray destroyed the castle after the Battle of Langside in 1568 in retaliation for its owners, the Hamilton family supporting Mary, Queen of Scots. As with almost every other place in Scotland, Rutherglen changed utterly after the 1560 Protestant Reformation. The borough had a parish church dedicated to the Virgin Mary, which for centuries was controlled by Paisley Abbey, but after the Reformation the church was owned by prominent local Protestants. Only the medieval tower remains, close to the old parish church which dates from the late 18th century. Many visitors remark on the width of Rutherglen's main street, and that was due to the remarkable fairs which were held in the town possibly even before the first royal charter of 1126. Rutherglen as a royal borough was able to hold two fairs, basically a glorified market day per year, and by the 17th century had several fairs annually, as confirmed in a charter of King James VI and I dated 1617. In his 1793 book, Ewer stated, Horses seem to have been the chief articles of sale, for which the fairs of Rutherglen have become famous. The horses are mostly for the draft, and are deservedly esteemed the best for that purpose in Europe. They are generally of the Lanark and Carnwath breed, which was introduced into the country more than a century ago. It is said that one of the predecessors of the present Duke of Hamilton brought with him to Scotland six coach horses, originally from Flanders, and sent them to Straven, the castle of which was at that time habitable. The horses were all stallions of a black colour and remarkably handsome, the farmers in the neighbourhood readily embraced the favourable opportunity crossing this foreign breed with the common Scotch kind and thereby procured a breed superior to either. From this a strong and hardy race of horses was soon spread through the country, but in many places owing to neglect was left to degenerate. This breed became known as the Clydesdale and spread far and wide from Rutherglen in the late 17th and 18th centuries. As the biggest settlement in that part of Lanarkshire, Rutherglen grew as a market town, but the bridging of the Clyde at Glasgow stopped it from becoming a major port, though there was a Rutherglen quay to service the small boats which came to the town, and as Glasgow grew, Rutherglen's importance declined. However, the 1679 declaration of Rutherglen once again put the town at the centre of national events. It was the time of the Covenanters' rebellion against King Charles II's anti-Presbyterian dictates. Support for the Covenanting cause was banned as were their meetings, or conventicles, and a contingent of about 70 Covenanters chose Rutherglen as the place to make their stand, 
Glasgow was already occupied by troops under John Graham of Claverhouse, or Bloody Clavers as he became known. On May 29 that year, the Covenanters nailed their declaration to the Market Cross in Rutherglen. Here's a couple of excerpts. As the Lord hath been pleased to keep and preserve his interest in this land, by the testimony of faithful witnesses from the beginning, so some in our days have not been wanting, who upon great hazards have added their testimony to the testimony of those who have gone before them, and who have suffered imprisonments, finings, forfeitures, banishment, torture and death, from an evil and perfidious adversary to the church and kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ in the land. Now we being pursued by the same adversary for our lives, while owning the interest of Christ according to his word and in the national and solemn league and covenants, judge it our duty, though unworthy yet hoping we are true members of the Church of Scotland, to add our testimony to those of the worthies who have gone before us. The declaration went on to condemn bishoprics and the expulsion of ministers who rejected bishops and by association the religious supremacy of the monarch. Having burned copies of the various anti-Presbyterian acts, the Covenanters took to the moors at Drumclog, where Claverhouse tracked them down within two days. On June 1, the Battle of Drumclog saw the Covenanters victorious, with 36 dragoons of Claverhouse's force left dead on the battlefield. Three weeks later, and with massive reinforcements led by the Duke of Monmouth, Claverhouse got his revenge by winning the Battle of Bothwell Brig. By the late 17th century, Coal mining had become established in Lanarkshire around Rutherglen, coal being discovered perhaps as early as the 1500s. Mining would remain an important local industry into the 20th century, with miners from the town working at pits such as Farm Colliery and the Govan Mine. In the 18th century, Rutherglen flourished as a centre for horse trading, and Ewer was of no doubt that the strict quality control practised by local breeders was the reason why Rutherglen became so important in the equine trade. He wrote, No inducement whatever can lead them to encourage the breed of a horse that is not possessed but of the best qualities. Their laudable attempts have proved successful and Britain is now reaping the merited fruits of their well-directed care. Every farm almost, through the extent of several parishes, supports six or at least four mares, the half of which are allowed annually to foal. The colts or twelve-month-olds are mostly sold at the fairs of Lanark and Carnwath and bring from £5 to £20 each. They are generally purchased by farmers from the counties of Renfrew and Ayr, where they are trained for the draft till they are about five years old. They are then sold at the fairs of Rutherglen and Glasgow from £25 to £35 each. From thence they are taken to the Lothians, England, etc., where they excel in the plough, the cart and the wagon. By the late 18th century, Glasgow's growth as a port and centre for industry far outshadowed Rutherglen, whose population never kept pace with the boom in Glasgow. A major construction which made travel to and from Rutherglen less difficult was the building of Rutherglen Bridge in 1775 to the design of no less an important figure than James Watt, then in the civil engineering phase of his career, before his work with steam kick-started the Industrial Revolution. That revolution did not pass Rutherglen by, and coal, steel and chemicals were all produced in and around the town, which at one time was also a centre of the textile industry. One remarkable individual made his mark in the town and Clydeside in general. Sea Captain Thomas Seath came from East Lothian to Glasgow, where he started his own shipyard at Meadowside before starting a ferry service between the city and Rutherglen in the 1850s. William Ross Shearer tells us about the state of river trade at that time. The boats which came to Rutherglen were lighters, fishing gabberts or long flat-bottomed boats. They were also masted vessels carrying from 20 to 40 tonnes burden. The masts were so constructed as to admit lowering them when passing through the old bridge of Glasgow. The boats usually went down the river with the ebb tide, propelled by poles to keep them off the banks. Seath decided that the Clyde's shallowness at Rutherglen was no obstacle to the building of numerous types of ship and he set up his yard just to the east of Rutherglen Quay. An innovator at heart, Seath began to build specialist ships such as ferries, paddle steamers and many other types of vessel with a shallow draft. He built some 275 ships between 1856 and his death in 1902. The coming of the railways in the 1850s also helped Rutherglen's trade and industries, and such was the prosperity of the area that the magnificent town hall was constructed in 1862. It's well worth a visit in itself. Usually I stop each column at the year 1900, but Rutherglen has one important story to tell from the early 20th century. 
In 1912, Glasgow annexed the independent boroughs of Partick and Govan. The city also tried to get Rutherglen, but local people who knew their town's history fought the annexation and they won. By Hamish McPherson. The National, recorded on Wednesday, 3rd of April 2024. The Culture Section. Craig Tara Holiday Park gets go-ahead for massive expansion. By Kevin Dyson, local democracy reporter. Councillors have given Craig Tara Holiday Park the go-ahead to replace its golf course with almost a 140 new caravan pitches, despite hundreds of objections. The park's owners had sought permission from South Ayrshire Council to create 137 caravan pitches at the site off the A719. The development has faced significant opposition, largely in claims that the extension and additional traffic in Denure Road would exacerbate the existing traffic issues and increase the risk of injury and fatalities on the road as a result of queuing and cars trying to bypass tailbacks. Objectors said residents would bear the brunt of the disruption. Members of the Council's regulatory panel for planning considered the application by the park's owners Haven in February. Local authority officials had recommended plans be approved, but councillors opted to hold a site visit before making a final decision. The panel's latest meeting was told the applicant had proposed further measures around the traffic issue. This includes road widening to provide an additional wide lane of carriageway extending north towards the check-in location within the site. Planners report that this will, in effect, create three lanes for a section of the internal access and road network, as well as additional emergency access points for the park. A report by council officials said the third lane will allow two lanes of traffic to access the site and continue towards the check-in location, providing additional internal queuing stroke storage for around 30 cars. A new 1.5 metre wide path would connect to an existing path. Other objections were raised about the holiday park becoming too big, concerns about crime and antisocial behaviour at Craig Tara and the loss of the golf course and green space. The Ayrshire Roads Alliance had initially objected to the plans, but removed their opposition once they'd examined the mitigations put forward by the park. The development proposals involved the change of use and redevelopment of an existing ancillary nine-hole golf course situated within Craig Tara Holiday Park to form an extension to this established and long-standing tourism facility. This internal expansion of the park will incorporate 137 new pitches for caravans, alongside supporting infrastructure, landscaping, accesses and road and traffic mitigation. The planning officer's report states, The proposal is considered to represent an acceptable promotion of tourism and tourist accommodation and an acceptable growth of an existing rural tourism business. A total of 223 objections had been sent to South Ayrshire Council, none of which, according to planners, were strong enough to merit refusal of this application. Planning officers responded to a number of questions from councillors and confirmed that talks were ongoing about planting semi-mature trees to ensure screening takes less time than it would had saplings been planted. Councillor Ian Kavanagh, Labour, Air North, also asked whether the work would begin on the road upgrade before the extension itself. He was told that there is a condition that would require the road improvements to be carried out before anyone could move into a caravan, but not the actual construction work. The park opened as Butlin's Air just after the Second World War, before being renamed Wonder West World in 1987. It was taken over by Haven, who renamed it Craig Tara in 1999. The site already contains a total of 1,417 static caravans, either privately owned or for rental, as well as sports facilities, entertainment venues, restaurants, bars and retail. The park currently has a licence from South Ayrshire Council, allowing up to 1,457 pitches, meaning that the number of pitches will rise above that limit. Councillors in the panel approved the application. By Kevin Dyson, The National, recorded on Wednesday, 3rd of April 2024. The Culture Section. Exclusive Tartan Week, Scottish Independence Film, To See Yourselves in New York. By Laura Pollock, Multimedia Journalist. Scottish Independence Referendum Documentary, To See Yourselves, is heading to New York for an exclusive screening during the city's annual Tartan Week. Tickets have gone on sale for the showing, plus a Q&A with award-winning director Jane McAllister at the People's Forum in 37th Street, New York, on April 5. The city celebrates National Tartan Day on April 6. Scott's actor Doug Ray Scott will lead the parade this year. 
The show has previously had several showings in Scotland, including Glasgow, Dunfermline, Bowness, Stirling, Edinburgh, Dundee, Inverness and Oban. McAllister, who said she is jumping in at the chance in New York, captured the footage of the referendum campaign during the summer of 2014, despite having no budget for the film. While heavily pregnant, she followed her father, Yes campaigner Fraser McAllister, as the referendum unfolded in the east coast town of Musselburgh. The team previously raised £25,000 to fund the post-production editing of the material, as well as its promotion online and in cinemas through Kickstarter. The director is now heading to New York a couple of days early to hand out flyers to people in kilts. McAllister told The National, I do think the film will give an insight into real modern Scottish life amongst the dancing and pipes, and as America stands in its own binary election year, a film of activism and belief in a cause will strike a chord. So it has previously said that fighting for support for the film has been exhausting. After failing to make the final selection for the Central Scotland Documentary Festival in Stirling, the event had been her last hope after being rejected from all other Scottish festivals. McAllister's concerned that the film's lack of success in the festival circuit is down to its political nature. It was unsettled to learn that the Central Scotland Documentary Festival screened a film about Brexit from a pro-Remain perspective. Tickets can be found at peoplesforum.org by Laura Paul, The National, recorded on Tuesday 2nd of April 2024. The Culture Section Mary Black to debut comedy show at Edinburgh Fringe Festival by Emma Padner Mary Black will perform her first fringe comedy show at this summer's festival. Focusing on her time as an MP, Black's show, Politics Isn't For Me, offers audiences a front row seat into her experiences in Westminster and is the youngest elected person to the House of Commons. Politics Isn't For Me, presented as part of the Gilded Balloons Fringe Offering, is a reflection of Black's time in politics and a preview into what's to come for the Paisley and Renfrewshire South MP after deciding to step down following the next general election. Expect a brutally honest look at politics as I embrace my fairly dark sense of humour to reflect in my time there, Black said. Her comedy act will feature as part of the Gilded Balloon Showcase, alongside returning comics including Michelle Brazier, Grace Campbell, as well as social media performer Christopher Hall. Brazier's show Legacy is a journey through the women she could have been if her choices in life were different. Grace Campbell is on heat, will see the comedian dive into adulthood, relationships and mental health. Hall, whose background singer sketches were popularised on social media platforms, will perform Girl for All Seasons. There will be a musical adaptation of Liz Truss's tenure as Prime Minister, titled 44 Days of Liz Truss, performed by the Tectonics, an all-STEM student a cappella group from Imperial College London, and a retelling of all episodes of Friends from the perspective of Central Perk barista Gunther. Family-friendly shows including Baby Shark and Tales of the Seven Seas and Sing, Sign and Sensory, a show including animations, sensory pods and songs for children aged 0 to 24 months. These shows will be featured at Gilded Balloon Patter House in the National Museum of Scotland between July 31 and August 26 by Emma Padner, The National, recorded on Tuesday 2nd of April 2024. The Culture Section, Review Simple Minds, Fans Stunned with Homecoming Show by Craig McConnell One thing I will always think of when Simple Minds are mentioned is that they were the band to follow Queen at Live Aid. They did it, and they held their own. Thirty-eight years later, they were back home in Glasgow on Friday and Saturday to finish the UK leg of their global tour before heading off to Europe. The support for this tour is another Scottish gem, Delamitri. The appearance is somewhat bittersweet due to frontman Justin Curry's recent Parkinson's diagnosis, which he says will stop him. It's exhilarating to see them on a huge homecoming stage, but being reminded that these opportunities won't last forever stings. It's easy to put the sadness at the back of our minds, however, as Justin beams across the stage while they launch into Always the Last to Know. It's clear that a lot of the crowd already in the sellout arena were here for Delamitri as much as our headliner. Justin's voice is soft and warm while the chemistry between the band members was a joy to watch. Perhaps absurdly, there's no role to me in the set, which would have been a solid fan favourite. Maybe it's not a band favourite, and with support slots, you always have to do a bit of culling of tracks, but it was missed by us in the stalls. 
Finishing with Nothing Ever Happens almost makes up for it, although it ends the set in a more melancholy note than Roll to Me would have. Simple Minds returns to the home stage with a hero's welcome. The Hydro is all seated tonight, but it needn't be, they go unused. Opening with Waterfront gives guitarist and only other original member Charlie Burchill a chance to showcase some expert note wrangling. The sustained harmonics and soaring lead guitar fill the hydro easily, while Jim Kerr's vocals are as powerful as they were 40 years ago. There's a fair bit of dad dancing going on by our frontman, but we can give him a free pass in return for the moment he drops to his knees and folds his body all the way back to the floor before effortlessly rising up again. The sound at this show really sits in layers. We have the airy guitars on top sitting up in the rafters, the vocals coming right down the middle at us, and driving bass working its way through the crowd from the feet up. The mix coming from this stage washes over you rather than bogs you down, and that's something really refreshing. The stage loathes with visuals and massive screens, but they're so aligned with the music that you almost forget they're there. The lights lift the performances to another level, most notably in Belfast Child, where dreamy white lights move through a haze, somehow filling the gap left by the lack of instruments. It would be a complete injustice to not mention the heroic efforts of both Sarah Brown and Sharice Osei tonight. Sarah has the unenviable task of providing backing vocals, and she does so without breaking a sweat. She makes matching and occasionally overtaking one of the greats seem effortless, and it's a pleasure to witness. It makes absolute sense that she gets her own numbers to perform tonight. Sharice has been on drum kit duty since 2017 and proves why she's sticking around. Tight drumming with an infectious grin across her face, her solo which follows New Gold Dream, 81, 82, 83, 84, channels Bonham and Mullen Jr. beautifully with her own accents and twists. The show simply would not be as good without this pair in stage. The moment that most of us were waiting on, don't you forget about me, comes with the crowd's best participation of the night. The hey hey hey's and oh's could have gone on for hours and no one would have minded. A great bit of clapping and la la la's in the bridge strings us along for who knows how long while Jim quips encouragement before an outstanding crescendo. Perhaps this should have been the song to finish on as anything else is a come down. Sanctify Yourself is a good second choice if I couldn't have the sing along but I'd love to have left the hydro tonight with the earworm living happily inside my head. Friday's show left me wishing I could go back for the second night by Craig McConnell. The National, Thursday the 4th of April from the News Section. Historic listed building in Glasgow Centre to be affordable housing. A listed building in the centre of Scotland's biggest city is set to become affordable housing. The West of Scotland Housing Association, WSHA, announced it had purchased the B-listed station house in Glasgow St Enoch Square and would be converting it into flats. Andrew Kubiski, WSHA's Asset Management Director, said the building would be developed into up to 26 mid-market rent properties, which will provide new affordable housing options for residents. The station house at 34 Enoch Square consists of two Victorian blocks which were originally built in the 19th century as the headquarters for the Glasgow and South Western Railway Company. Historic Environment Scotland said it has been a B-listed building since 1988 and was built around 1860. Kubiski said WSHA had been supported in the acquisition by Glasgow City Council through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme, adding that he was delighted to play a part in the council's strategy to bring people back into Glasgow city centre to ensure the sustainability of the city for the future. The building was listed for sale with Savills for offers over £1.85 million, but the final price paid has not been made public. WSHA said the apartments in the conversion will be listed at mid-market rent, MMR. The association said this meant they would be aimed at those on a low to moderate income who wouldn't qualify for social housing, but can't afford to pay market rent or buy a property. WSHA added rents are higher than for social housing, but still lower than for private lets, 
and MMR tenants enjoy the security of being part of a housing association community with access to a repair service, support services and with their white goods and flooring supplied. SNP councillor Kenny McLean, Glasgow City Council's housing convener, said, This is significant news that illustrates the changes underway in Glasgow City Centre and we are delighted to support WSHA on this project. The repurposing of this vacant property and increasing the city centre population are key goals in our strategies for the area. The plans for this striking building will not only bring it back to life, but also help revitalise St Enoch Square as residents enjoy affordable, high quality and energy efficient homes in the centre of Glasgow. This is an article by Xander Eliards. The National, Thursday the 4th of April from the News section. Massive poll predicts winner in every Scottish seat at general election. Full list. A massive new poll has predicted the results of every seat in Britain at the next general election. The YouGov survey of more than 18,000 people found that Keir Starmer's Labour Party would be in for a landslide election victory, similar to that won by Tony Blair in 1997. The Tories are predicted to face a dire result, returning just 155 MPs, according to the poll. The poll further predicted that in Scotland, the SNP are not set to win a majority of seats and will trail behind Labour. For Scotland, the YouGov survey predicted the SNP would win 19 seats, Labour would win 28 Scottish seats, The Tories would win five Scottish seats and the Lib Dems would also return five MPs. In the next general election, Scotland will return 57 MPs, not 59, due to boundary changes. The YouGov analysis uses the multi-level regression and post-stratification, or MRP, method of polling. The results of every Scottish seat, as predicted by the YouGov MRP survey are Aberdeen North SNP Hold Aberdeen South SNP Hold Aberdeenshire North and Murray East Conservative Hold Airdrie and Shots Labour Gain from SNP Alloa and Grangemouth SNP Hold Angus and Perthshire Glens SNP Hold Arbroath and Brody Ferry SNP Hold Argyle, Butte and South Lochaber, SNP Hold. Ayr, Carrick and Cumnock, Labour Gain from SNP. Bathgate and Linlithgow, Labour Gain from SNP. Berwickshire, Roxburgh and Selkirk, Conservative Hold. Caithness, Sutherland and Easter Ross, Lib Dem Gain from SNP. Central Ayrshire, SNP Hold. Coatbridge and Bells Hill, Labour Gain from SNP. Cowdenbeath and Kirkcaldy, Labour Gain from SNP. Cumbernauld and Kirkintilloch, Labour Gain from SNP. Dumfries and Galloway, Conservative Hold. Dumfriesshire, Clydesdale and Tweedale, Conservative Hold. Dundee Central, SNP Hold. Dunfermline and Dollar, Labour Gain from SNP. East Kilbride and Strathaven, Labour Gain from SNP. East Renfrewshire, Labour Gain from SNP. Edinburgh East and Musselburgh, Labour Gain from SNP. Edinburgh North and Leith, Labour Gain from SNP. Edinburgh South, Labour Hold. Edinburgh South West, SNP Hold. Edinburgh West, Lib Dem Hold. Falkirk, SNP Hold. Glasgow East, Labour Gain from SNP. Glasgow North, Labour Gain from SNP. Glasgow North East, Labour Gain from SNP. Glasgow South, SNP Hold. Glasgow South West, Labour Gain from SNP. Glasgow West, SNP Hold. Glenrothes and Mid Fife, Labour Gain from SNP. Gordon and Buchan, Conservative Hold. Hamilton and Clyde Valley, Labour Gain from SNP. Inverclyde and Renfrewshire West, Labour Gain from SNP. Inverness, Sky and West Rossshire, SNP Hold. 
Kilmarnock and Loudoun, Labour gain from SNP. Livingston, Labour gain from SNP. Lothian East, Labour gain from SNP. Mid Dumbartonshire, Lib Dem gain from SNP. Mid Lothian, Labour gain from SNP. Murray West, Nairn and Strathspey, SNP hold. Motherwell, Wishaw and Carluk, Labour gain from SNP. The Isles of Lewis, Labour gain from SNP. North Ayrshire and Arran, SNP hold. North East Fife, Lib Dem gain from SNP. Orkney and Shetland, Lib Dem hold. Paisley and Renfrewshire North, SNP hold. Paisley and Renfrewshire South, Labour gain from SNP. Perth and Kinross, SNP hold. Rutherglen, Labour gain from SNP. Stirling and Strathallan, SNP hold. West Aberdeenshire and Kincardine, SNP gain from Conservatives. West Dumbartonshire, Labour gain from SNP. That was an article by Xander Eliards. The National, Thursday the 4th of April, from the News section. Please confirm no hate incident recorded against Hamza Yousaf or J.K. Rowling. Since the Scottish Government's new Hate Crime and Police Order, Scotland Act, came into force on Monday, Police Scotland has received numerous allegations against both the First Minister and the Harry Potter author. The allegations against Yousaf refer to a speech he made in the Scottish Parliament four years ago about a lack of racial diversity in positions of power in Scotland. While the complaints against Rowling relate to her social media posts, in which she refers to transgender women as men. Police Scotland had already said that neither of the incidents met the threshold for being considered a hate crime. However, questions were raised about whether they would be recorded as non-crime hate incidents in the same way Tory MSP Murdo Fraser's comments about non-binary people were. A spokesperson for Police Scotland said, The circumstances have been assessed and will not be recorded as a non-crime hate incident. Fraser previously threatened legal action against Police Scotland for recording his tweet as a non-crime hate incident. Now he has claimed the decision not to do the same for Yousaf and Rowling amounts to political bias. This decision means Police Scotland have not only breached their own policy on recording non-crime hate incidents, but now appear to be making it up as they go along, he said. They have taken a different approach to comments made by the SNP First Minister to those made by an opposition politician. This reeks of political bias. It is hard not to conclude that Police Scotland has been captured by the SNP policy agenda. I expect the Chief Constable to contact me urgently with an immediate apology for recording a hate incident against me and confirming all records in relation to it have been destroyed. They should also ditch their existing unlawful policy, as has been done in England and Wales, which I believe is a clear breach of people's human rights. It comes after top academics in Scotland debunked a number of viral posts spreading misinformation about the new hate crime laws including one by Rowling. That was an article by Ross Hunter. The National, Thursday the 4th of April, from the news section. Whole of SNP would like to see end of Operation Branch Form, says Hamza Yousaf. The First Minister has said he would welcome an end to the police inquiry into the SNP's funding and finances as the anniversary of the arrest of the party's former chief executive approaches. Friday marks a year since the arrest of Peter Murrell, husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, as part of Operation Branch Form, Police Scotland's investigation into how 600,000 of crowdfunding for campaigning for Scottish independence was spent. The inquiry was launched in July 2021, but took a dramatic turn on 5th of April 2023 when Morell was arrested at the home he shares with Sturgeon outside of Glasgow. Police officers searched the house and erected a blue forensic tent 
outside the property, with searches also carried out at SNP's Edinburgh HQ. Several criticised the scale of the police response, including those who do not support SNP. Morell was questioned for several hours before being released without charge pending further investigation. The following month, the party's then-treasurer, Colin Beattie, was arrested, then released on the same basis and stood down from his post. On June the 11th, Sturgeon was arrested in relation to the inquiry, voluntarily attending an interview before being released later the same day, pending further investigation. She then posted on social media that she knew beyond doubt that I am in fact innocent of any wrongdoing. Murrell's arrest came less than a week after Hamza Yousaf replaced Sturgeon as First Minister and, in the following days, it emerged that a luxury camper van thought to be worth about £110,000 had been seized by police investigating the party's finances. Asked this week if he is frustrated over the length of time being taken by the inquiry, Yousaf told BBC Scotland, Well, I think people will realise that all of us in the SNP would like to see a conclusion to Operation Branch Form. I think that's stating the obvious, but of course it's up to Police Scotland to determine how long that takes and for them to have the space and time to investigate thoroughly, and I don't intend to interfere in that. It is for Police Scotland to take as much time as they require in order to investigate thoroughly. Police Scotland confirmed they were investigating in July 2021 after seven complaints were made around donations to the SNP following allegations that £600,000 raised for campaigning towards Scottish independence was diverted elsewhere. The party said all sums raised for independence campaigning will be spent on independence campaigning. Police Scotland's then Chief Constable, Sir Ian Livingstone, confirmed in July 2023 that the investigation had moved beyond what some of the initial reports were saying. This is not uncommon in financial inquiries. Speaking shortly before retiring from his role, he said he would not put an absolute time frame on the length of the investigation, but that it would be proportionate and timious. The following month, he said, the sooner this investigation is included, better for everyone involved. A Police Scotland spokesperson said, as the investigation remains ongoing, we are unable to comment. This is an article by Laura Pollock. This is from The National on Thursday, 4th April 2024. From the comment section. We need acceptance, not just awareness of autism. By Kelly Given When I sat down with Autistic Scots author Colin Burnett this week, in the 21st century remote working version of Sitting Down Anyway, it struck me just how similar we are. We might have been born in different decades, be of different genders, and come from different parts of the country. But there was an unmistakable likeness between us, a shared experience that transcended those differences. Both autistic, albeit diagnosed at different points in life, with Colin diagnosed in childhood and me in adulthood. Both with a sprinkling of dyspraxia for good measure. Me with the addition of ADHD, and Colin with the addition of dyslexia, which is the reason we came together in the first place. This week is the annual Autism Awareness Week, officially, though the autistic community has reclaimed it as Autism Acceptance Week, citing that the former had become commercialised, corporate and tokenistic. The consensus is that society needs to evolve past simply being aware of autism and actually embrace and accept autistic people in all walks of life. 
Autism Acceptance Week was built on the back of World Autism Awareness Day as coined by the United Nations General Assembly. It is celebrated annually on April 2nd, with its inaugural year being back in 2008. But it actually stretches as far back as the 1970s. The Autism Society first launched National Autistic Children's Week in 1972. The founder of the group, autism research researcher Bernard Rimland, chose April as it coincided with his autistic son's birthday. It has evolved since then and is often a difficult month for the community to stomach but it is slowly being reclaimed by those it aimed to serve in the first place. While I agree that it has by and large been co-opted by corporate giants looking to capitalise on minority struggle for whatever reason, and even if fleeting, people are paying attention. Arguably, there is no better time than the month of April to spotlight autistic people themselves, and the various contributions they are making to the world. To say Colin's debut novel, A Working Class State of Mind, was a smash success would be quite the understatement. It has almost five-star reviews across every platform, sold out multiple print runs when it hit the shelves back in 2021, and bagged him two award nominations. The now fiction classic, which was entirely written in East Coast Scots, follows the trials and tribulations of beloved main character Aldo Alley as he navigates, alongside best friends Doogie and Craig, the harsh class divides of modern Edinburgh. Though a beloved fictional character to many, The inspiration behind Aldo and the story that brought him to life is one of deep personal experience. A particular point of inspiration stood out for Colin, the sudden loss of both of his parents in his early twenties. I resented the way the state treated me in the aftermath. I was put on trial for being autistic, is how Burnett describes the months and years after the loss of his parents. A loss he shares he has never recovered from. Forced through a tribunal process where his specialist advocate was not even allowed to speak on his behalf, the experience inspired Colin to put the state on trial instead and expose the realities of our class-divided society. He shared that the authenticity of his work was of special importance to him, that he often comes under fire for using swear words, but that swearing culture is an accurate part of working-class society and he knew that his intended audience wouldn't relate to the character of Aldo if he was not speaking their dialect and the point of the novel would fall flat. He wanted the character to represent, in the most authentic way possible, the working class experience from the perspective of a lether. Above everything else he does, his overarching intention is to give a voice to the voiceless, whether it be the working class whose stories he feels are often unheard, or the autistic community that he has inspired with his work. As autistic people tend to do, we then went down a five-minute rabbit hole about how language policing is such a prominent class issue. What I really wanted to know, though, was how he navigates his career specifically as an autistic person. And when I pressed him on it, I got to the core of the grit and determination that has brought him the success he enjoys today. Inspired by his older brother, himself a playwright and screenwriter, Colin's love for writing was ignited back in high school. Despite struggling with dyslexia and being discouraged by unsupportive teachers, he knew he had a passion 
and encouraged by his supportive parents, he set on the path to university, where he began writing and self-publishing short stories. When I asked him how he works around the executive functioning difficulties that come with being neurodivergent, his advice for aspiring autistic authors was to begin with a short story because they are less overwhelming and make for great practice and profile building. Looking ahead, Colin wants to incorporate autistic characters into his future works and believes there is a huge importance incorporating the reality of being autistic through, specifically, fiction. He spoke passionately about the lack of fictional representation for the autistic community and with disdain for the examples that so often dominate the narrative and entrench stereotypes. At multiple intervals throughout our conversation, he emphasised his belief that Life is not a dress rehearsal, telling me, you have to go for it. When Colin expressed to his high school English teacher that he wanted to be a writer, she laughed at him and told him it would never be possible. He is now a best-selling, award-nominated author of two novels, and he tells me work is underway on new projects. I'd say he has, quite emphatically, embodied the very principle that he holds so dear. Though autistic people are as varied as anyone else, the more I connect with our community, the more I recognise that our experience of navigating the world often draws many parallels. There is an almost unspoken universal experience of being autistic, and it allows us to relate to each other from a unique perspective that is only available to those of us within the community. A shared haven of sameness in a world where we are often othered and made to feel different. This Autism Acceptance Month, while doing my utmost to avoid the inevitable onslaught of multicoloured jigsaw pieces, I'll be learning from, reading about and, where possible, platforming my fellow autistic people. If you really want to raise awareness, look to the source and avoid the corporate fanfare. Colin Burnett's new book, Who's Alto, published by Tipper Muir Books, is out now and available from Waterstones and Amazon. That article was by Kelly Given. This is from The National on Thursday, 4th April 2024, from the Culture section. More than 1,300 shows added to Edinburgh Festival Fringe lineup. By Ross Hunter. More than 1,300 shows have been added to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe programme. Performances including cabaret, comedy, dance, circus, musicals and opera have been added to the lineup with a total of 1,373 revealed on Thursday. Another 274 had already been revealed, bringing the total to 1,647 shows so far with more due to be added in May and June. Bookings can be made on edfringe.com from moon, noon on Thursday for the festival, which runs between August 2nd and 26th and is in its 77th year. Audiences have been encouraged to book in advance and to promote the Fringe on social media to boost morale. Among the newly listed performances was How to Catch a Book Witch at Underbelly, aimed at children aged four and older, described as an open-hearted show aimed at exploring the importance of libraries and sharing stories. Another show, Good Girl at Paradise Green, was touted as an immersive, interactive clown adventure as she plays with male fantasies, female sexuality 
and how we navigate 21st century womanhood. Early years audiences were set to be entertained by Sing, Sign and Sensory at Gilded Balloon, described as an immersive creative experience in customised inflatable sensory pods for babies and toddlers. An innovative performance of Macbeth at St Stephen's Theatre mixes the original script with music from Foo Fighters, The Prodigy and Dire Straits, while at Hill Street Theatre, Rave is a jukebox musical set in a nightclub, exploring an ageing friendship group. SMP MP Mary Black is also set to make her fringe comedy debut at Gilded Balloon. Shona McCarthy, chief executive of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society, said, It's super exciting when a new batch of shows gets announced. You can really feel the momentum gathering as August gets closer and closer. I can't wait to get stuck in and add some more shows to my favourites list and to book a few in, just in case they sell out. Artists are the backbone of this festival and they're at the heart of everything we do at Fringe Society. Booking tickets in advance, adding free and unticketed shows to your favourites lists, giving shout-outs to artists and companies on social media using Unleash Your Fringe hashtag. These are things that fringe audiences can do to show some essential early support and boost morale for the artists they love. So if your fave is coming to Edinburgh, or if a show tackles an issue that's close to your heart, get it locked in now. That article is by Ross Hunter. From the National, Thursday the 4th of April, from a sports section, Celtic transfer target brutally told he's reached his peak. Article by sports writer Ewan Payton. Reported Celtic transfer target Sami Samojic has been brutally told he's reached his peak. That's the view of Sky Sports pundit and commentator Don Goodman. The EFL expert believes the only way for Samojic 28 to reach the promised land of England's top flight would be to get promoted with a championship side. The Republic of Ireland International has been in fine form for Blackburn Rovers in the championship this season, which has fueled speculation linking him with a move to Glasgow. But Goodman believes the player will not improve further from his current level with the Ewood Park Club. He told Crypto Casino Limited, Sammy's got to keep on working hard and he may get an opportunity to move to a club that has an opportunity to reach the Premier League with all respect to Blackburn. The only way he could reach the Premier League is by getting promoted with a club. With respect to him as a player, the step up is massive. I would never say he can't make the step up, but looking at his career, I'd say he's at his peak and our Premier League team will not come in for him. It's no dig at him, the same statement applies to a whole load of players in the Championship. Meanwhile, a major John Beaton decision has been overturned by the Scottish FA just days ahead of the match between Rangers and Celtic. The experienced official had sent off Cammy Kerr in Inverness's loss to Partick Thistle on March the 30th. However, the decision has now been overturned after a fast-track tribunal with the red card rescinded and a yellow card also removed. Beaton had cautioned Kerr, on loan from Dundee for simulation in the first half of the Championship contest. In an article was by Ewan Payton and read by me, Ian McKenna. From the National, Thursday the 4th of April, from the sports section. Hamilton thinks Vettel could be a good fit for Mercedes. Article by Martin McMillan. Lewis Hamilton has tipped Sebastian Vettel as an amazing option to replace him at Mercedes. Seven-time world champion Hamilton is moving to Ferrari from next season, leaving big shoes to fill at a team where he has lifted all but one of his driver's titles. Vettel, meanwhile, has hinted at the return to Formula 1 grid next year having left in 2022. 
The German won four titles back to back between 2010 and 2013 with Red Bull and has recently had a test with Porsche that could see him race at Le Mans later this year. Since 2000, three of the six world champions to leave the sport later returned to the grid, with Vettel potentially set to add to that list. Michael Schumacher, Fernando Alonso and Kimi Raikkonen all had time away from F1 before being enticed back and Vettel admitted in a Sky Sports interview on Wednesday that it does cross my mind when it comes to securing a new drive and has spoken to Mercedes boss Total Wolf. The departing Hamilton said it was never a consideration of his to take time away from the sport before hailing Vettel as an ideal replacement as a team that has struggled for pace in the past two years. No, I've never thought about taking a year or two off and then coming back. When I'm gone, hopefully I'm gone for good, he said. You're always going to miss it. It's the greatest sport in the world and it's the greatest experience in the world and the most amazing feeling to be working with the people towards winning something. Probably there's nothing that's ever going to feel the same. I've not asked any of the drivers what they're missing, but I would love for Seb to come back and I think it would be an amazing option for the team. A German driver, multi-world championship winning driver, and someone who has amazing values who would continue to take the team forward. I'd love it if he came back. Push further on who we'd like to see take his seat, whether it be Vettel, reigning champion Max Verstappen or an F1 rookie. Hamilton replied, The only thing I really care about is that the team takes on someone with that with, that with integrity, that are aligned with the team and where the team is going. Someone compassionate that's able to work with great people and continues to lift them up. There's so many great people in this team. Hamilton's current teammate George Russell was confirmed for Mercedes in 2025 and was enthused when it was pitched to him that he could he could be joining a returning Vettel. Sebastian's a great person, he said. He's a four-time world champion and for sure his personality is missed on the grid. I think it is important we have the best 20 drivers in the world all competing for race wins and championships. I'm really happy and open to anybody as my teammate, you know, whether it's world champion, whether it's a rookie, it doesn't change how I go about my business. And that report was by Martin McMillan. From the National, Thursday the 4th of April, from the sports section. Scottish refs snubbed by FIFA and Olympics officials and VAR list. Article written by Mark Walker. Scottish referees have been snubbed by FIFA for their list of officials and VAR operators for this summer's Olympic football tournament, despite 45 countries being involved. The Paris tournament takes place from July to August later this year, and World Football's governing body have appointed 89 match officials, 21 referees, 42 assistant referees, 20 video match officials and 6 support referees from countries across the globe but there's no Scottish representative at the event. Two English Premier League referees, Rebecca Welch and David Coote, were named and there are 23 officials from across Europe at the tournament. Scotland were also without a representative at the last major tournament, the World Cup in Qatar. UEFA have yet to announce their final list for this summer's Euro 2024. Polish Jamon Marciniak who took charge of the World Cup final between Argentina and France, has been tipped to be the ref for the opening game at the Euros between Scotland and host Germany. Meanwhile, Scottish FA Head of Referee Operations Crawford Allen will step down at the end of the season. The experienced official has worked in the role for four years but will depart in the summer to pursue new opportunities. A review of the role and remit, with key consideration of the introduction and optimisation of VAR, will take place as Alan leaves the post and an experienced replacement is sought. Alan was a referee in Scotland for 30 years, 15 in the top flight, before stepping up to the high-ranking Scottish FA post where he played a major role in the implementation of VAR. And that article was written by Mark Walker. That concludes this week's edition of the National Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.